Welcome to Case Flash, brought to you by the CBA Family Law Section. I'm Sam Schoonmaker, and joining me today are Judge Elaine Gordon and Alan Palmer. Today we will discuss the Supreme Court's decision in Woodbury Knoll v. Shipman and Goodwin. Uh, we'll begin with the majority decision with Alan Palmer. Woodbury Knoll LLC v. Shipman and Goodwin LLP is an important decision for two primary reasons. First, the case further defines the rights of non-parties to a case to file an interlocutory appeal from an adverse discovery ruling. Second, it res resolves an apparent conflict between the attorney's obligation to maintain the confidentiality of information under Rule 1.6 of the Rules of Professional Conduct, the attorney's obligations to provide discovery pursuant to a court order under Rule 3.4, and the attorney's obligation to not knowingly violate the Rules of Professional Conduct under Rule 8.4. The facts of Woodbury Knoll are fairly straightforward. Woodbury Knoll sued Shipman and Goodwin and others for legal malpractice in connection with a real estate transaction. Finn Dixon and Hurling LLP represented Woodbury Knoll in the malpractice case. Part of the plaintiff's claim included a claim for reimbursement of the fees paid to Finn Dixon. Shipman and Goodwin served a subpoena ducis tecum upon Finn Dixon to produce, quote, all documents, including without limitation, notes, memoranda, emails, pleadings, document production, billing statements, time records, and every other form of written, typewritten, printed, or computer-generated material related to Finn Dixon's representation of Woodbury Knoll. Both Finn Dixon and Woodbury Knoll filed separate motions to quash and objections to the subpoena ducis tecum. Both claimed the... Uh, the motion, the subpoena should be quashed based on the attorney-client privilege and the work product doctrine. Shipman and Goodwin objected to the motions to quash and moved to compel discovery. The trial court overruled Finn Dixon's objections, denied the motions to quash, and granted Shipman and Goodwin's motion to compel. Here is where the conflict in the rules becomes apparent. Under State v. Curcio, a judgment, is, is, uh, a judgment may be appealed as a final judgment if it terminates a separate or distinct proceeding or so concludes the rights of the parties that further proceedings cannot affect them. Under most circumstances, a discovery order is not a final judgment for purposes of, of appeal because it ordinarily is not a separate or distinct proceeding uh, and does not terminate the rights between the parties. An order of judging a party in contempt, however, is a final judgment for purposes of appeal. In order to appeal an interlocutory discovery order, a party has to be first found in contempt for violating the discovery order and then appeal the contempt order. Under this protocol, Finn Dixon had two options. They could produce the documents and run afoul of the confidentiality provisions of Rule 1.6, or they could refuse to produce the documents and run the risk of running afoul other obligations under Rules 3.4 and 8.4 for knowingly violating a discovery order. Finn Dixon, however, chose a third option. They filed a writ of error in the Supreme Court. The writ of error is the traditional common law method of review by the Supreme Court. It provides for review in situations where no right of statutory appeal has been provided. The writ of error is used to review a trial court ruling concerning a non-party. The first issue addressed by the Supreme Court is whether the interlocutory rulings by the trial court were final judgments for purposes of appeal. If the rulings were not final judgment, the Supreme Court did not have jurisdiction. The Supreme Court found that this discovery order was a final judgment and re relied almost exclusively on Abreu v. Leone at 291 Connecticut 332, which is a 2009 case. In Abreu v. Leone, DCF was sued in connection with personal injuries allegedly sustained by a child in, in its custody. The child's foster parent was served with a subpoena to, to uh, appear at a deposition and testify about the child. The foster parent refused to disclose any information about the foster child in the personal injury case, relying on the confidentiality of this information pursuant to statute. The foster parent was ordered to sit for a deposition and produce the information. The foster parent appealed. The appellate court initially dismissed the appeal for lack of a final judgment. On certification, the Supreme Court reversed and found that the interlocutory order terminated a separate and distinct proceeding 
between the foster parent and the plaintiffs, and that any further proceeding will not preserve a right already granted to the parent, foster parent, and that right will be irretrievably lost and irreparably harmed if they were not entitled to appeal. In Abreu, the Supreme Court stressed that the focus is on the non-party's right that is threatened, not on the underlying merits of the case. Here, both prongs are met for Finn Dixon, a non-party, to immediately appeal the discovery order. First, the order denying the motion to quash and the order compelling the production effectively terminated their proceeding with Shipman and Goodwin. Remember, Finn Dixon was not a party to this case. Second, the nature of the claim of right, the confidentiality of the information under Rule 1.6, would be irreparably lost forever if Finn Dixon were to comply. When Justice Zarella makes a direct citation to the reign of Elizabeth I, my experience is that he's trying to make a very important point. I think that is what happens in this case with regard to the law of privilege. Here, there's an overwhelming public policy to protect the attorney-client privilege, which uh, Justice Zarella notes is the oldest of the recognized privileges, because the law wants clients to be forthright with their attorneys and their attorneys to give honest advice in return. The court's discussion of the impact of the, on the attorney-client privilege is very broad in its scope. In the majority's response to the dissent, he succinctly writes that the policy consideration in this case is whether the attorney's interest in preserving the privilege and the potential for sanctions provides a sufficient justification for the attorney to seek immediate appellate review of a discovery order. An attorney has an affirmative obligation to invoke the attorney-client privilege when the substance of the privilege communications is sought and unlike the client cannot unilaterally waive such privilege. The short version, a claim of privilege under Rule 1.6 takes precedence over the lawyer's obligations under Rules 3.4 and 8.4. The attorney is no longer required to make a choice between disclosure and violating an order of the, order of the court. Non-disclosure now appears to be the rule once this appeal was decided. Thank you, Alan. Now we're going to shift to discussion of dissent with Judge Gordon. To say that the um, dissent disagreed with each and every point of the majority opinion, I think, would be an understatement. Um, in writing for the uh, minority, um, Justice Evely disagreed that the Curcio standard had been met in either its first or its second prong, um, and uh, went back to the Abreu case. First of all, read it much more narrowly, as I'll discuss in just a moment, but also said that in some regards, Abreu had conflated the two prongs of um, uh, the Curcio test and was really not a first prong case, but a second prong case. Uh, it is interesting to note that this case was brought um, under uh, the, on the appellate level by the parties below, um, claiming that the second prong of Curcio had been met. Uh, the Supreme Court decided it on the first prong. So Justice Evely basically saying that the Abreu discussion of the first prong was a mistake in his dissent would have rewritten this opinion completely. When I say that the um, dissent read the case more uh, narrowly, uh, Abreu that is, uh, what I mean to say is that they indicated that the idea that there would be a privilege um, that could be uh, read here uh, to include the attorney-client uh, privilege was too broad of uh, a reading. That they basically said that non-parties should not basically have greater rights than the parties themselves and that the majority's uh, emphasis on the uh, idea of attorney-client privilege was mistaken, that they had overinflated its um, value. Um, and to underscore this, basically said that the client themselves doesn't get to invoke the privilege and protect materials in discovery, and therefore that the attorney shouldn't either. Um, they basically said that there was an overemphasis by the majority on the idea that an attorney was faced with either contempt proceedings, which might invoke in, uh, disciplinary proceedings, or the baying of the court order, and pointed out that Rule 1.6 of the Professional Code allows for an attorney to turn over otherwise privileged documents after a court order. And then, most of all, and I think that the recurring theme of the dissent is that um, the uh, final judgment rule is being um, abridged 
uh, in a way that will open the floodgates. Uh, and the dissent basically sees this as opening the floodgates, not just on discovery issues, um, but on all kinds of uh, third party uh, claims. And basically says that this encourages a piecemeal litigation, that the rights of the parties to a prompt resolution and the needs of the justice system for the same are going to be abrogated by the uh, majority's decision. Thank you, Judge Gordon. I'd now like to open this up to the panel. And the first question I have for both of you is, uh, is every discovery decision that impacts a non-party now appealable? I think the majority opinion says no, that these are very fact-specific analyses. And really, the only issues that are subject to appeal are matters of privilege or matters of fundamental rights, i.e. constitutional rights. But no, I don't think I don't think this opens the door for appeals where every non-party is ordered to produce documents. Well, it seems to me that we don't yet know what uh, imaginative attorneys will claim is a uh, important, valuable right soon to be irreparably lost. Yeah, um, from right to privacy or due I, process right of some sort. Yeah. Right, um, and uh, so I'm a little bit concerned that um, it's, it's going to go beyond just this. I mean, I haven't sat there and thought of everything that can happen, but I can see imaginative people doing that. Certainly in family cases, we, we um, involve all kinds of issues that have um, privacy uh, aspects to them, things that affect people's kids knowledge that you might not want out because somebody may be harmed by it? I'm not sure. Can we talk for a moment about um, what this means in terms of moving business through the court? Uh, do you see, do either of you see this decision causing significant delays in the resolution of family cases? Yes. Sure. I mean, I, I would bet you that the underlying action in this case hasn't proceeded. So why would it be any different? And in, in um, family cases, we know that we have claims for attorney's fees um, in so many cases compared to what happens on the civil side, where it's really only on punitive damages and those types of claims. Here, we get them all the time. We get them pendente lite. We get them all. And so I can imagine that um, if you get into this argument uh, regarding the reasonableness of the fees and what they were spent on and the discovery ensues, that we could be slowing down litigation tremendously. One of the things that the neither the majority nor the dissent really elaborates upon is that, except for very limited circumstances, there's an automatic stay of execution with regard to orders that are subject to an appeal. Uh, if in a family action this issue came up, it's not clear to me whether a stay would necessarily be in effect or not be in effect just simply based on this decision. Uh, if, for instance, the information that was requested pertained to a financial, an alimony hearing or a, a child support hearing, then the information may be treated differently than if it was for some other purpose, because there's no automatic stay of execution on orders involving alimony or child support. Uh, and I think that neither side really uh, addresses that issue in any manner. Are you saying that you think family attorneys might try to fit a discovery decision involving a non-party into the exceptions to the automatic stay rule for, for, uh, for appeals, fitted into custody, visitation, uh, alimony, child support, is that what you're saying? I, 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 th I think there's creativity on all sides, and if, if the lawyer is going to be creative to take the appeal, I think there's an equal chance that the lawyer opposing the appeal is going to be creative to try to do away with the termination of stay. What do you do if you are the attorney who, um, who wants to move the case forward and uh, the other side has, is now asserting Woodbury Knoll uh, rights. What do you do to move your case forward? The first thing you have to do is make an honest assessment about whether the information that you're seeking is really needed for your case. Because if the answer to that question is no, then I think it becomes a lot easier to move on, your, on with your case. Assuming the information is necessary, I think that bringing a motion to terminate a stay would be the first order to determine whether or not there is a stay in place. 
um, because nothing's going to happen under under this fact pattern until the information is gotten. And I think that you're probably going to craft your discovery request a little more narrowly, and perhaps if um, somebody is making that claim of privilege, that you're going to ask for the creation of a privilege log so you can further narrow the issues and try to avoid the problem, because otherwise you're facing a long delay, and if what you want to do is move it along, you're going to be limiting your requests, I think. And I think outside of the courtroom, my experience has always been that probably 99% of these are going to be resolved with a stipulation once the judge makes his ruling in favor or against any motion to quash uh, this type of discovery. And most of these are, are done by stipulation. Can we talk for a moment about the privilege log? Uh, who should ask for a privilege log and under what circumstances do you ask for a privilege log? Well, what? The I'm sorry, the, the, the case um, basically says that it's not incumbent upon the person claiming the privilege to create the privilege log, which is true. And the privilege log is normally created in response to a court order um, in which the other party is going to say, well, look, I'd like, the, I'd like to have a privilege log and I'd like some in-camera review to see whether these documents are or are not um, privileged. And on the civil side, that happens relatively frequently um, where privileges are implicated and happens quickly. I think it's incumbent upon the person seeking the discovery to actually make the request. Mm -hmm. it's, it's definitely not an affirmative obligation. The, uh, in this case, the majority says it's not an affirmative obligation on the person asserting the privilege to create a, a privilege log. That's something that may be ordered by the court, but it's not an affirmative obligation. Uh, is there anything different about uh, discovery in family cases versus civil cases that you see um, that affects you know, the, the, the daily practice under Woodbury Knoll? Let me rephrase that. Well, do you mean, um, well, I, I think I mentioned something before. Um, we. If you just take this issue, which was a claim for attorney's fees, uh, it comes up much more frequently in family and so therefore would now implicate more discovery regarding the reasonableness of fees. Um, and um, it's going to add to what are already, I believe, some difficult problems on the family side regarding discovery. Yeah. So you see these issues coming up, well, especially in the, uh, the fee, the, the, the 46 fee 62 fee motions, the 46B87 contempt uh, motion seeking fees, the Ramin motion seeking fees for egregious litigation misconduct yeah. is coming up in, in all circumstances. I, I think also that we're, we're going to see this problem a lot more on the family side because by definition the lawyer is much more enmeshed in the client's day-to-day -day lives and day-to-day -day business than they are in, in your, your typical personal injury or, or commercial litigation situation. Um, in Woodbury Knoll, it was a real estate action that, that apparently failed for the plaintiff. Um, in, a, in, a, in a divorce case, you're involved in the client's day-to-day -day managing of their household finances. You're involved in the day-to-day -day parenting of their children, um, in addition to dealing with the cause of action between them and their spouses. So there's a lot more opportunity for us to advise clients on a, on a myriad of issues that any smart lawyer can tailor a, a deposition question or an interrogatory question that would necessarily encompass the attorney-client privilege. Thank you for watching this second installment of Case Flash, and thank you to our two speakers who spent a lot of time preparing for this. Uh, please give us your comments. Uh, this is a new program. We want to hear how it's working, if you like it. So please respond to the survey. Thank you.